She's looking good. On today's show, we take to the pheasant hunting fields of South Dakota with a very special hunting partner. You dog. <laughs> It's that time of year. October means fall leaves, crisp temperatures, and yes, bats. Bats of all kinds. One way that you can kind of mask a little bit. And we're heading to Lisa Erickson's kitchen to check out some wild game recipes on the menu. How about some burgundy venison? Oh, I missed it. Our classic this week features migration, not geese or ducks. How about the migration of monarch butterflies? Those stories and more, next. Minnesota Bound. Brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. We're just kind of kicking back in the back of our Yukon. This is where Raven rides when we're on the road. Speaking of being on the road, you know, I've taken many, many pheasant hunts, but the one you're about to see is one of my all time favorites. Beautiful day. Days tend to be that way when it's pheasant season in South Dakota. It's a beautiful place to come. It's just exactly where it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be means following behind an eager dog. She's working good. In grassy cover where ringnecks roam. There's a rooster right there. People are lucky to find really important things in their life and this is mine. When you first meet Kim Stevens, you may not think of him as lucky. Luck is important to this pheasant hunter from Colorado. Luck, and lots of it, is the only reason Kim Stevens is alive today. Well, he's a dandy too, isn't he? Well, I got in a motorcycle accident on yeah, August 30th, 1974. So I was 21 years old. The accident spared his life, but it did take his right arm. And uh, I couldn't fathom shooting a shotgun again. So I just gave it up. Gave it up. Gave it up for more than 10 years until. And a girl. Until a hunting dog came into his life. Uh, he made me want to train him, so I did. And so I had to pick up shotgun during the training process and <laughs> kind of took off from there. In time, the missing arm no longer mattered. I've been longer without it than I had it, so. It's kind of just the way I am now, and it's the way I have to live. It's almost normal to me now. But wing shooting skills aren't easily relearned. The first time I, I tried to do it, I failed miserably. And I said, okay, I'm gonna learn how to do this. So I practiced and practiced, just like shooting a jump shot or learning how to write when you're a kid or even riding a bicycle. What do we got here? Because I had a childhood accident, I lost most of the vision in my left eye. So I had to learn how to shoot you dog! <laughs> With a left-handed grip off my right shoulder. <laughs> it's a little unorthodox and it raises a lot of eyebrows, but it actually works quite well if you practice at it enough. There's got to be one more in here, I know it. <laughs> Good girl. Good left, look to the left. Across the way, our hunting companions, led by guide Jeff Youngberg, Holy mackerel. We're finding ring next to. We lease about 16,000 acres that we manage for pheasants. We'll just line up across this and walk over to those trees. Hunting's brought so much to my life, you know, guiding and everything, the people that I've gotten to meet. And, you know, it doesn't matter if they're, you know, a millionaire or, a, you know, a, a factory worker. It doesn't matter. Everybody's on the same page playing field when we're out here. Rooster Ron, good shot. Very nice shot. Needless to say, it was a good day to be a pheasant hunter. Right Two arms <laughs> or one. Oh my Lord. There aren't many moments in a pheasant hunter's life when too many birds is a problem. Here comes another one. When deer are bounding hither and yon over fields full of ringnecks. Look at there. <laughs> 
Rooster! But it's a nice problem. What fun. That's a rooster. See me come back. Jesus, man. Got that one. It was just amazing to watch him shoot. He is, he is just a fine shot, a fine gentleman. I mean, it was, it was a real pleasure hunting with him. He inspired me, you know, that uh, you could really put it, do anything you want if you put your mind to it. You know, there's gonna be people coming back from the military that have lost an arm or a leg, and I just wanna tell them that if you wanna do it bad enough, you can't and you're only limited by what you can dream. Especially in South Dakota, in a field of dreams. Just one, there you go. Everyone can head for their areas. Coming up, we all know the benefits of bats, so why not visit a few in the mystery cave? Now don't be scared. No, they don't. No, no vampires here. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota's select GMC dealers. Connecticut. Rapala Ice Force. And by Grand Rapids Tourism. You know, Minnesota has many state parks, but only a few caves. And one of those is still a mystery. Five or six per group should, should be pretty good. At Find out where you're going. That's Just right. one, Just there one. you go. Everyone can head for their areas. These folks have an eye for the little brown guy. They're gonna be coming out from underneath it, and lots in the corner. Here goes one. Yeah, I love it. Watch him. Counting bats. It's an annual event here at Minnesota's historic Forestville State Park. Hey, I like the count with the bats. I like the count with the bats. <laughs> now that was 23. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> one by one they fly, as bats do, on nocturnal flights. Oh, uh -oh. two of them just came out. Hundreds of bats in search of food. Oh, hear them squeaking up there. 31, 33, 33, 34. Five. Now to keep track of them all, it drives some people, well, a little batty. Two, three, four. Oh, 55 or 54. It's really fun, except it's it's easy to it's easy to lose count. <laughs> Dick Nelson brought his two kids along to learn more about where bats live and what they eat. Never really thought about them much until we started reading books about them with our kids and learned how valuable they are to the environment. 89. The bat count gives park officials a good idea of how many bats live in the area's caves. We're hoping to see an increase every year for the conservation efforts we put in place at Mystery Cave. Ah yes, Mystery Cave. For bats, a perfect name. Wide-eyed and stepping carefully, these second and third graders enter the dark and wet limestone cave, home to 2,000 bats who hibernate here in the winter. Do we have any questions here at this point? <laughs> okay, yes, what would you? Um, how does the bats hang from the ceiling? Are there any, like, larger bats? Do vampire bats use this cave? No, they don't. No, no vampires here. Inside the cave, the bats keep their eyes closed while the children keep an eye open for creatures who spend their days upside down. It's not unusual that bats on our cave tours will fly in very close to people, just maybe a few inches away from their face or circle their uh, heads. Now the bats hibernate in the cave for up to nine months a year, and for good reason. The temperature in the cave stays a constant 48 degrees. There's four different kinds of bats that use Mystery Cave. While on tour, Netherton tries to dispel common misconceptions about bats. For instance, not all bats carry rabies or get tangled in your hair. Although they can't see color, bats see better at night than you and I. 
which means there's no such thing as blind as a bat. A lot of the kids came out and said, well, I used to be scared of bats, but I'm not anymore. Netherton says there's lots of good things to say about bats. They're the only major predator of night flying insects. They can eat 600 mosquitoes an hour. It's incredible what those, those, um, those little creatures can do. So the next time you're in Mystery Cave or outside counting bats. 78, 79, 89. 80. 80. Just remember, if you're blind as a bat, you'll never truly see just how amazing bats really are. Whoa! <laughs> it's great for us to, to have the kids and the people experience this and see that bats are not the terrible creatures that you know many of us believe them to be. Wow. We've got some nice red Merlot, and you want to go ahead and just pour Ooh. that in right over the top. And now last but not least are my favorite baby bella mushrooms. Here they are. It's that time of year for yeah. cooking wild game. I help Lisa Erickson with an easy venison recipe that's sure to be a hit with your hunting family. Beans that I've cooked up already. Closed captioning is brought to you by Starkey Hearing Technologies. It's time to go wild in the kitchen, this time with Lisa Erickson, who has something, I guess it's wild game, a cooking. Lucky me, because I'm back in Lisa Erickson's kitchen where something wild is always cooking. Lisa, what's on deck today? Well, today we have some wild venison burgundy. Mm, you know, a lot of people don't like venison. That's true. Our family loves venison. And this is one way that you can kind of mask a little bit of those wild flavors if they might come through. Mm -hmm. And this venison, you told me, is very special. It is. It's my son Lee's very first deer he got this year. And I'm going to surprise him when he gets home from school with some wild venison burgundy. Let's get started. All right. I'm just cutting it into bite-sized chunks. I've got just under three pounds of venison meat. This couldn't be easier. I'm just going to take two cans of golden mushroom soup and dump it in. Golden mushroom. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, there we go. Uh, well, I'm good at something. Can I put these in the garbage? Yes, you can. Thank you. Next, we've got a little onion soup mix, and okay. we're just going to sprinkle that in. When are we going to get to this wine, Lisa? Uh, we've got some nice red Merlot, and if you want to go ahead and just pour oh. that in right over the top. Right. And now last but not least are my favorite baby bella mushrooms. Here they are. There was just a couple? Yep, that's it. That's all we need. Is that enough? Perfect. All right. Now I'm just going to stir it all together. Doesn't that smell good? Yes. The wine gives it such nice flavor. Mm -hmm. Ron, how easy was that? Well, I know, but we're not done yet. What do you do with this now? Well, now we're just going to bake it uncovered for an hour and a half at yep. 300. 300 mm -hmm. for an hour and a half. Yep. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Ron, it's time to cover it with the tin foil. Okay. All right. And then how long are you going to cook it? I'm going to cook it for another two and a half hours, and we've got some time to do a little ice fishing. Ooh, I hope they're biting. I hope so, too. All right, Ron, it's all done. Oh, yeah, it's done, huh? Yeah, it smells wonderful. Mm. Let's take a peek. Mm -hmm. Voila, voila. Oh, here we go. And I've got some fresh green beans that I've cooked up already to go with it. Wonderful. Lisa, this looks awesome and smells delicious. Oh, well, Ron, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what I call wild chow. The tag this butterfly is going to get is JHM626. Our Minnesota Bond Classic this week deals with magic. Not the kind that involves pulling a rabbit out of the hat, but the monarch kind. So when we let this go, this is one that will attempt to migrate to Mexico. Uh, if it makes it there, somebody will possibly find the tag and they'll know that we tag this butterfly. Minnesota Bound, 
Brought to you by Radco Truck Accessories. The Minnesota Horse and Hunt Club. And by Eggstar Financial Services. Welcome back. You know, in recent weeks, you've seen them, I've seen them, twittering and fluttering south, the migration of monarch butterflies. Still, truly, one of the wonders of nature. Oh, you're so oh I missed it! Hunting for the king of butterflies. the miracles of nature, the most common of them all, a backyard version of Believe It or Not, may be the erratic autumn flight of the monarch butterfly. Got it. Good job. The best way is to, to get it out is to hold all four of its wings together. With a monarch in hand, naturalist Valerie Queering of the Richardson Nature Center is performing a rather miraculous procedure of her own, banding a bug. The tag this butterfly is going to get is JHM626. So we have to record the number on our tag. We have to record the today's date, if it's a male or female, if we caught it in the wild or we raised it in captivity, and the location. Now we have a tagged butterfly about to attempt a rather unbelievable feat. So when we let this go, this is one that will attempt to migrate to Mexico. If it makes it there, somebody will possibly find the tag and they'll know that we tagged this butterfly um, on September 5th in Bloomington, Minnesota. Yes, migrate to Mexico. Not all monarchs do it, but millions try. This is the generation of monarchs that are heading to Mexico. The other um, populations that we've had uh, have just laid their eggs, died, and it's the last generation that we have here in the summer that will migrate. Hope it gets to Mexico. Under a program called Monarch Watch, ah! got it, got it, got it, got it. Volunteer butterfly banders are merely ah! trying to help scientists answer age old questions like how do the monarchs know where to fly to? These butterflies are going to fly to somewhere that they've never been before. Mm -hmm. Their great great grandparents came from Mexico and they're gonna make a migration and they know exactly where to go and they go to the same area to overwinter as generations before them and they've never been there before. Got it. The monarch study led by the University of Kansas is in its 16th year. For a number of years we didn't know where the monarchs went and it wasn't until the 1975 I believe that um, people that lived in North America discovered their overwintering areas in Mexico. The destination for these Minnesota-born monarchs is a volcanic mountain range four hours west of Mexico City, a distance of roughly 1,800 miles. Travel time, two months at least. But for migrating monarchs, it's also a one-way trip. When they um, overwinter there, that, that population will live about um, eight months, and then they will um, head back and start the spring migration, and then they will land in Texas area, lay their eggs, and then die. So the cycle continues. A butterfly so common in so many places, yet so magnificent in so many ways. And to think it all begins in something called the pupa stage. When it came out, its wings were like wet paper, so it'll be a couple hours before it can fly. Fly away to Mexico, a monarch with no map. Just another backyard miracle we can't explain. Ah, the beauty of monarch butterflies. By the way, in a few weeks, we'll have more stories about the monarch butterfly, including information on what you can do to improve their numbers. Well, that about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors. I'm Ron Sher, and of course, always the star of the show. She's not driving, but that's Raven. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation.
Call 1-800-899-7433. For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com.